I've learned after years of making everything way too complicated with these big Fortune 500 companies that if you're in a consulting business, you're in a relationship business, that means you're in a conversation business. And your sales process is really simple. It's two steps. Figure out exactly who you want to talk to and talk to them. And if you do those two things, good things will happen. And if you don't do those things, you're going to struggle. I think so many of us get this wrong. We're really desperate for the business. And so everyone we talk to becomes the next prey. And it's like, if I just connect with more people, someone will say yes. And, and that's largely true, right? If you reach enough people, someone will eventually say yes. But if you spend a little bit of time going deeper with each person, you probably find that more people will say yes of the people who are reaching as well. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of More Clients, Less Efforts. I'm your host, Tim Hyde, and today it is my great pleasure to be introduced to, and I'll introduce you to the amazing Ruben Schwartz. Ruben, thanks for joining the show. Great to be here, Tim. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure, man. My pleasure. Ruben is the founder of Mimiran. It's a fun serum for independent consultants who love serving clients but hate selling, which I would agree is so many of us. He's also the host and chief nerd on Sales for Nerds podcast and went from a background in computer science and software engineering to sales and marketing consulting for Fortune 500 company, now, which is a really interesting sort of pivot there as well. While struggling with the sales and marketing for his own firm, his mission is to help other independent consultants make a big dent in the universe and get more clients by using their talents to teach instead of market, connect instead of network, and help instead of sell, which is, I think, a super important thing and something our regular listeners would uh, we talk so much about. Ruben, talk me through the journey. Well, gosh, I don't want to bore your your listeners, but basically I'm one of those software people, came down to Texas to work at a software company because I thought if I didn't come down for the interview, I would never set foot in Texas and I should at least come for the weekend. And then I yeah. decided, well, gosh, it's actually kind of nice here. Maybe I'll be here for a year or two. And here we are 20 something years and two kids and a dog later. And I've been here the whole time. So clearly I'm not very good at predicting the future, but I was working on sales and marketing software for giant enterprises. And one of the things that frustrated me was I felt like by the time the requirements got back to me, it was like, I don't know if you play the game of telephone where you whisper in someone's ear. And by the time it gets back to the first person, it's, it's total, totally different than what you started out with. And I had this, this cocky assumption that, that if we could bring the technology and the strategy and the business process together, we could maybe get better results with less effort to kind of tie into the theme of this show. And I thought, let me go help some of these clients do this. So instead of we're going to spend a year drawing up a grand strategy and then a year doing a bake off and then a year implementing, and then we get to the end of year three and it's been reorged five times and we don't remember why we did this in the first place. What if we did something made some incremental progress in three months, made some incre incremental progress in three months and so on. And it turned out as much as I had no idea what I was doing really at, at that young age, that this was actually a pretty good approach. And, and we got good results for people. We got repeat business, we got referrals. And I wanted to get beyond just waiting on referrals or waiting for a client to call me up and say, hey, let's do another project. Because of course you're kind of going in that feast or famine cycle. I wanted a sales or marketing machine like I was helping my clients optimize. And I knew I didn't know how to do that very well, but I thought I'm getting paid to sit in the room with some of the top sales and marketing minds on the planet. So let me just take good notes and copy what they're doing, right? It seemed to make sense at the time. Of course, it was an absolutely terrible idea. And the better I did at it, the worse things got. And it's obvious to me now that if you have a 5,000 person sales team and you have a $5 billion marketing budget, how you do sales and marketing is going to be very different than if you're doing rainmaking for your boutique consulting firm in your spare time. Yeah. Yeah. And we're talking rainmaking being the ability to attract business into your world, right? I think it's really interesting that you, you talk about that. Uh, it's almost like building a house. Right? By the, when you start the house, you have one set of requirements. And then by the time you finish building a house, you've got another two kids, two kids and the dog. <laughs> they different things. And you think, oh, I wish my kitchen had a bigger pantry. <laughs> right. right. And your software development life cycle is very much the same. I actually... Because I, I come out of the software space as well, and I always found that the customer in many ways didn't understand 
what it is that you were trying to achieve, right, with software, right? They didn't really understand that, hey, I need to break down all these little steps. And in the same way, I don't think, just like software development, I don't think that our customers really know the journey that they want, that we want them to go on either, right? So just because they want to go their own way, we sometimes need to chase them and follow them. But we're trying to architect this so we get the same result and those customers go on a predictable path every single time, isn't it? And of course, you also have some of the software vendors who see everything through the lens of their own product, whether or not it's right in a particular case for a particular customer, right? And then then you kind of have that mismatch, which is what I was trying to solve for some of these customers, or right? especially some of these big enterprise deals. One of the things I, I hated about the enterprise world is it was sort of this weird game theory where they would have these giant requirements documents and, and big competitive bake-offs. And anyone who responded honestly to the RFP wouldn't make it to the second round because nobody could fulfill all these requirements. There's just no way. So the people who made it were the ones who were the best at making it seem like maybe they could do it. And it was sort of this cat and mouse game that just left a bad feeling in my stomach afterwards. And one of the things I realized I would end up doing some projects in between some of these big projects for smaller firms, sometimes even solo firms. And I thought, gosh, it's really nice. You can go in and work with these small companies and you can change their lives in an afternoon. I wish there was a way I could do that that would pay the bills because it was really more of a hobby between the big projects at that point. And I didn't have a light bulb moment saying, oh, I should build a CRM for these people. That's not what happened at all. But it's kind of funny how it worked out that way. Yeah. What was it about working with, I guess, owner-operator-led consulting businesses compared to the enterprise that really attracted you? I mean, you talk about being able to actually see the impact. Is that the main reason for you? I think that's a big part of it. The other thing is it's it's working with a past version of myself. So as much as I really cared about helping my big enterprise clients, it wasn't personal in the same way. And there's a different energy I realized in the way I think about it and the way I talk about it when I'm helping basically me versus when I'm helping these big corporations. And it's not nothing against that, right? There's plenty of people who come from that world where all that stuff is very personal. To me, it was more like a game. I wanted to help my clients win the game. Whereas when I wake up now and I'm tired and I don't really want to get out of bed and I don't want to walk the dog and I don't want to go do all the million things, I just want to like sleep a little bit longer. But then I remember that feeling in the pit of my stomach of thinking that sales and marketing was so scary and not knowing how to go do it and realizing that there's so many people out there wearing those shoes today, and it's my job to help them, that gives me a lot more energy than let me go help add a few more pennies per share to some big company's bottom line, right? Nothing wrong with that mission. It just didn't have the same visceral impact on me. Yeah. I think what you're, what you're talking about really is understanding your why in business, isn't it? Right? And we can do a whole bunch of things. It's, it's remarkably how similar our both our journeys are as well. I came out of big corporate and government as well as an IT guy. Mine was for project management and I found so many of the projects I was running, it kind of didn't have meaningful impact or we'd spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars and then the project to be cancelled. I'm like, what am I doing here? It doesn't seem to have any purpose, right? Someone threw a stroke of a pen in the accounting department or a new executive has decided to go in a different direction because they didn't like the previous, the previous boss and they're trying to put their own stamp on things. Right. And so much of that seemed kind of, yeah, I mean, yes, as you say, right, for the bottom line, yes, it paid really well, but kind of didn't have, as you say, that visceral meaningful impact on someone's actual life in many ways. And I was certainly getting in by the end of it. I was kind of like, what am I doing here? This doesn't seem right. You know, I love the paycheck. Right. Golden handcuffs are a thing that I've met, I think many people who have been in corporate and, and started their own business would be very familiar with. But also the, 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 the why of who it is we serve, I think, is critically important. And really understanding that and going, well, why do I get up on a Monday morning? I love Mondays. Sorry, Garfield. Why do I love Monday? Right. Why do I love going to work? Why do I love the clients I want to work with? You know, and really understanding that. But even you know, articulating it, I think it's a really powerful thing. Just listening to you, I'm going like, I've got a warm, fuzzy feeling, right? Because this well, is what you help business owners right. Right, who run their own business owners get ahead. That's exactly right. And and we, we have that in common. And it's something that's bigger than us as an individual, right? We are part of a broader mission. Mm. So it's not just about us and our egos. We, we might have egos as well, but but we're not just saying, hey, look at me, we're great. It's this 
tribe of people that we're trying to serve. We are part of, of that mission. And so the right people can sense, hey, great, Tim and Ruben, those are my people. And other people might say, oh, no, they're not my people. And that's totally fine as well because we have our lane and we're not worried about you if you don't want to be in this lane, then you go do your thing. What do you think solo consultants, and I, I won't say this is unique to software development and, and technology people, but what do you think so many people, when they start out, struggle with sales and marketing or kind of go, I don't want to do it. I'm going to go and get someone else to do this sort of thing. Why is that? Why is that? I think there are a number of reasons. One, we're taught that it's impolite to brag, which I think is, is a good thing. But we have trouble talking about ourselves in a meaningful way. And the, the analogy I like to use is we are Superman for our ideal clients, but we walk through the world as Clark Kent. We're in disguise and nobody really knows that we're Superman unless somehow they pry it out of us or somebody makes a referral or something like that, because we're not good at showing up with our cape billowing out saying, hey, I'm here to save the day. And most of the examples we see of people acting that way, they're they're sort of braggarts. They're not doing it out of service. They're doing it to make a quick buck. And I think it starts with that. And the next part is people have a lot of trouble getting very specific about who they want to help. So I hear this all the time. It's like, well, I'm, I'm a web developer or I'm a business coach. Who do you help? Well, I help businesses with websites. And in fact, if they don't have a website, then they need me even more. I'm a business coach. I help business owners who are stuck. Okay, that's every business owner on the planet. Like, it doesn't help me. It's like if you walked into the hospital and I'm going in because I need my shoulder repaired, but as I'm walking in, there's a knee doctor who sees that I'm walking a little funny. He starts trying to hit me with his business card saying, hey, Ruben, you need to get your knee repaired. And there's, I don't know, a dermatologist. Ruben, your skin doesn't look so good. Let me get you in here for some skin treatments. That's not going to go very well. And we would think it would be absurd for doctors to act that way. But a lot of consultants, they don't think they're acting that way. I didn't think I was acting that way, but that's essentially what we're doing. And when you're on the airplane and they say, is there any doctor on board? Because they'll take anybody. And if they can have their choice, they'll, they'll try to get as close to this, the right specialty as they can, but they'll take anybody they can get. That's one thing. But when you're walking into the hospital, you don't want every doctor stabbing you with a business card. So I've learned after years of making everything way too complicated with these big Fortune 500 companies that if you're in a consulting business, you're in a relationship business, that means you're in a conversation business. And your sales process is really simple. It's two steps. Figure out exactly who you want to talk to and talk to them. And if you do those two things, good things will happen. And if you don't do those things, you're going to struggle. Yeah. I think that's the thing about that I see a lot about marketing. We, we, we just go to someone and say, and particularly to, to marketing agencies, I guess, as business owners, we don't necessarily know what is the right strategy to reach our target market. So we just go to the marketer we know who happens to be in a networking group or work out of the same building and say, hey, help us. Right? And mm -hmm. that those people might sell Google ads. And so therefore you buy Google ads, but it's not necessarily the right strategy to reach the target market you want. And I think there are some amazing tools such as LinkedIn where you can go exactly to the person you want to talk to once you know who they are and say, hi, I want to talk to you. Right. And, and Google ads may work really well, but if you don't know who you're trying to talk to, it's going to be very hard to target the ads. And it's going to be very hard to put the right content in the ads and put the right content on the landing page that the ad goes to. Same thing if you're showing up and you're speaking from a stage or you're doing a bunch of networking in Zoom or in person, right? If you don't know who you're trying to meet and you say things like, well, I'm a business consultant, I help businesses who are stuck, that's not going to get you very far. But if you can say, I help alpaca farmers brought in their e-commerce offerings, I don't know how many alpaca farmers there are, but, but if I'm an alpaca farmer, or I know one, now suddenly I'm going to make the referral. Oh, you got to talk to my buddy, Tim. That's all he does all day, every day. He's an expert. Yeah. It's it, Why do you think it's so hard for us to narrow down who is we serve? I think there's a couple of reasons. One, a lot of us, we don't necessarily start with a grand strategy. So we sort of accumulate this smorgasbord of clients and we might like various clients for different reasons. And it's hard to pick out, okay, I'm just going to focus here. The other thing that I think is hard is everyone's really good at understanding, yes, positioning and narrowing and focus, all that's good. It's like motherhood and apple pie. 
And, and a lot of us are great at telling our clients to do this, but when it comes to our own business, we say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm different. And I, I'm convinced that it's like a lizard brain thing where it kind of taps into that fear of scarcity that we have from an evolutionary perspective. We don't want to cut off possible sources of food. We don't want to cut off possible social connections that, that we might have. And it doesn't matter how much logic we apply to fix an emotional problem. Right, I, we can run through all kinds of. I have spreadsheets where I show, you know, if you have strong positioning, here's how much revenue you make per conversation. If you have weak positioning, here's how much you're going to make. And it's so night and day. But the problem is, it's not a logical conversation in your own head. It's still an emotional conversation. And the only way that I was able to get myself out of that rut, because I struggle with this too, right, and helping my clients, but struggle with it myself, was to think: Do I want sales and marketing to be hard? Or do I want it to be easy? And that was the emotional fulcrum that I could tip to say, well, obviously I want it to be easy. I freaking hate sales and marketing. So whenever I have that debate in my head about am I getting too narrow, I'm like, well, is sales and marketing too easy? No? Okay, well then let's get narrower. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question. I mean, I do a lot of networking right? and and I constantly hear people get up and say, I'm looking for anyone or I'm looking for someone who... Rather than going, I'm looking for John Smith, who's the, the the president of this company. And does anyone know John? You get far more specific introductions. But I think you you're right. You picked up something there that I want to just reinforce to our listeners. The more specific you are, the easier everything becomes. And it is. You're absolutely right. It is completely illogical, right? It's completely lizard brain. You are cutting off other food sources to focus on the one food that is in abundance. And often people, unless you're trying to serve one-legged former dwarven astronaut suffering from gravity rehabilitation, right, you've, you've probably got a reasonable size market. And I, um, I think even in, if we just looked at acupuncturists, which is probably a fairly niche kind of business, right, there are 40,000 acupuncturists in the US alone that you could serve. That's a reasonable market. And if you're saying, hey, we serve acupuncturists in the United States, right, all of your messaging can be really, really specific to those people. And an acupuncturist looking for a business coach or a software developer or a, or a sales coach or a whatever, who now hears your message compared to everybody else's, will resonate more with you because you're a specialist in that area. That's right. And I think that's a great example. I didn't know there were 40,000 acupuncturists in the United States, but let's, let's say- Even better, there's probably only five companies that provide needles to those 40,000 acupuncturists. Right. Getting with those guys and you're probably really good. So say say you're a solo consultant, you serve that market of acupuncturists, you're already doing better than most by, by being able to narrow down to acupuncturists. But you can't serve 40,000 people as a solo consultant. Maybe you can if you write a book or have a course or something, but if you think about who you can actually do work for, it's a pretty finite number. And so I would encourage people to say, okay, great. It's acupuncturists who what? And maybe it's they're hiring their first staff member or there's some other thing going on in their practice. So even within that 40,000, we get down to about a thousand people say, and we're going to define the playing field such that within that playing field, even though we're solo, we are the 800 pound gorilla. We are the IBM or the Apple or the Google or whatever of that market, where if you're one of those people, you're probably going to have heard of me or you will soon and you're going to get a great, great referral because I do great work. Everyone loves it. And if I completely saturate this market, I can always broad it and I can always take work from outside that narrow focus. But why not be intentional? It's our business, right? This is the superpower we have. We could be intentional about who we'd really like to work with. That's going to make our lives so much easier. It's going to let us have greater impact because we're working with people who are actually going to go be able to implement what we want to do for them. And it's going to help their clients. We're going to make bigger impact in the broader world. We're going to make more money. And I think the other thing that's really important is we're not going to waste so much energy trying to convince those people walking into the hospital that they need the knee surgery when they don't, they're not there for that. That's where we get, I think, really hung up and think that sales and marketing is terrible because we're trying to convince somebody to do something that they don't want to do instead of saying, hey, for you people who really want to do this, you just need some help getting there. Here's why I can help you do it. Talk to me real quick. I know, I presume, I don't know whether you use Memorin in your business as well, but talk to me about how Memorin helps consultants turn 
leads to conversations. I mean, the conversation is the, the interim step to clients, right? Talk to me how that pro- about that process in Mimarin. Well, let me back up one step, if you don't mind, yeah. because I think it's important to, to tie in what you just asked with what we were talking about earlier. And as far as I know, Mimarin is the only CRM that asks you to define exactly who your ideal client is, what you do for them, how that's different than what they might've tried before or what they're going to do if they don't hire you and what your origin story was. Basically, look, why do you do this? And enterprise CRMs, right? They're built for a sales team where the VP of sales is going to hand you as a sales rep, hey, here's our sales playbook, got all the answers. But when it's your business, sometimes we don't put in the work because it feels hard. And then we go out into the world and we struggle. So first of all, there's that foundation. That is sort of like the step one of the process. Like, let's figure out who we want to talk to. And it's not like you just do that in a vacuum and then you go talk to people. Part of figuring out who you want to talk to is talking to people. Or it's going to your favorite clients and asking what you did for them and realizing, oh, they just described things in a way that I never would have thought of. But that makes so much sense. Okay, great. I'm going to feed that back in and so on. Now, when it comes to actually having those conversations, there's... People we already know, I think is sort of like the lowest hanging fruit that we neglect. Our LinkedIn connections, our past colleagues, people we run into. And when we do, we have a great conversation, but we don't make any intentional effort to actually have those conversations. And then when we go and and we expend effort, time, money, energy, whatever, to bring new people in that we're also not going to follow up with, right? Like we're just adding to the problem. So the step one is like, let's make sure that you're actually talking to the people that you should already be talking to that, that are already in your world. And the way I think about this in Mimarin is let's make it really easy to tag people. And then instead of a tag just being a classification, it's also going to have a default conversation frequency. Like how often do I want to be talking to this person? And most CRMs, you can manually enter when you want to talk to someone next. But if you don't do that, it's like poof, they disappear. And the idea here is by default, we're going to keep having conversations And I can manually say, I don't want to talk to this person anymore. And there's a way you can basically go in and say, okay, I want to put time on my calendar every Wednesday afternoon to make sure I'm talking to my partners. And Tuesday and Thursday, I want to make sure I'm following up with my prospects or whatever your your situation is. And of course, you can do it outside of those blocks of time. But what I found with myself and with my customers is, it's kind of like if you want to go to the gym, make your new year's resolution. You're going to get healthy, go to the gym, but you never put it in your calendar. It's a lot less likely to happen versus having it be baked into your schedule. Not a hundred percent guaranteed, but it's much more likely to happen. And when you have that calendar appointment, there's a big green button in memory that says start call mode. You click it, which takes you to the first person you're supposed to talk to. Press the button to call them, add your notes. You can see who referred them. You can see, you can search the notes from the other conversations. The whole idea being, We're not trying to automate away from conversation. We're trying to organize so that you can have effective, fun conversations. If you're having fun, you're actually going to want to keep doing it. This was the part that was shocking to me as an introvert who doesn't like salary. It's like, I was just doing it all wrong. That's why I hated it. I actually love talking to cool people. Let me just do it in a way where I don't feel like I have to be a salesperson. And eventually the right people say, hey, great. What would it be like to work with you? I can do that. Yeah, right. Most of us can handle that. that. The relationship, isn't it? I think so many of us get this wrong where we we desperate for the business. And so everyone we talk to becomes the next prey. And it's like, if I just connect with more people, someone will say yes. And that and, and that's largely true, right? If you reach enough people, someone will eventually say yes. But if you spend a little bit of time going deeper with each person, you'd probably find that more people will say yes of the people who are reaching as well. Well, and you're also going to learn kind of what you just go on first date. Yeah. Right. You just go on first dates, you'll never have a second date. Right. And you don't, And if you don't listen, you're just trying to pitch yourself, you're not going to learn what makes somebody interested or just as usefully not interested because you're going to feed that back into that view of who do I want to talk to, right? Maybe it's not acupuncturists who want to hire their first person, maybe it's acupuncturists who have a team of at least five people or whatever. I'm just making something up, but you learn this by having those conversations and you can refine. And there's nothing so liberating as feeling like you have a healthy pipeline. I think one of the mistakes I made that I see time and time again, people making is we don't actively nurture our pipeline. We don't have those conversations unless there's like a really hot opportunity. And then we're like all over it, like a fly on, you know what, 
and it's kind of awkward and uncomfortable. Like you, I love the you use the word prey. That's kind of what it feels like, right? It's You're like, stalking. It feels like prey. It feels like that to the customer as well, right? Yeah, and and then they they're like, wait a second, hold on. Like I thought I might want to work with you, but now I'm getting bad vibes, and that makes you even more desperate to pursue them versus feeling like you're the doctor, you're doing the shoulder surgery, you have a waiting room full of patients, you care about everybody's shoulder, it's really interesting to you, and the right people at the right time are going to say, gosh, I really need to get my shoulder fixed. And the people who aren't ready, or you say, hey, I know that you want to get this done, but here's why we don't want to do this right now. And you just have the liberty financially and psychologically of knowing you've got that waiting room full of, of people there. Now you can just have really natural conversations that ties directly into what you were just saying. Now the person on the other end knows they're having a conversation with a doctor who knows what he or she is doing, not somebody who's out there hunting them. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I think in the depth of relationship, people love to buy, but they don't like to be sold to. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the, that's the thing, right? And I love how Memorand is really set up to kind of go, well, here's the next conversation you need to have, right? Call, click to call kind of thing. And putting people into a cadence of average. I recall several years ago, I was talking to a web developer and, and, and only had a small profile on LinkedIn, about 650 connections that largely represented her ideal target market. And she was like doing maybe one, I think five or six websites a year, not a huge amount. She was a six figure sort of business, kind of doing it on the side, constantly going, oh, do I just need to go and find a day job to kind of get things by? My business is not working. I'm not getting referrals. A course going, hey, I want anyone, you know, who wants a website and connected to enough people. And, and here's some of the things we know about websites, right? Most people will rebuild their website every five years and they'll largely not use the previous web developer, right? Because that web developer has gone and got a day job as well. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Or over the five years, they've actually not gotten the number of leads from their website that they thought they were going to get. And they've gone, it might look pretty, but it's not delivering me the results that I want. So we go back out to market and look at a new one. Over the 650 people, you'd probably think that there's a percentage of those that are in the market at any particular time looking to build a new website, particularly as right. we know that uh, we know that we do it every five years. So let's let's round it down. Let's call it there's 50 people who are friends and family and the other 600 are potential customers. I mean, how, how often do you think, how much time do you think it would take to just touch base with those 600 people? Not every month, but maybe if you touch base with 50 people every single month, 100 people. Not very much time at all. Not very much time at all, right? You're probably talking half a day. Of, hours. Yeah. You know, a couple of hours, right? In fact, you probably get all through all 600 in maybe a day or two every single month. And again, a, a job that you could potentially give to a virtual assistant, right? Go and like someone's profile, comment on a post, right? Promote them in some way, share something that they've published. And you would be top of mind, right? Particularly sort of sharing and commenting on people's content. Because largely, right, no one does that. And that's what I call the influence pyramid. If you start sharing and commenting on stuff, you will influence the people who create that content because you're a peer on a regular basis. You're not just a like, and you're certainly not a lurker. Right? You're not somebody read their post, but you don't appear in their life at all. And and I said, okay, what out of the 600, that's probably 50 people per month that you've on the radar. Let's divide that by five because once every five years, they're doing a big website. That means there's 10 people in your network every single month who are now rebuilding their website or in the decision mode to go, who do we hire to rebuild their website? Do we just go to someone who's, that pops up at the top of a Google search? Or do we go to someone who's known in our network that most importantly, I'd like? Right. Because we have a regular conversation. Who already gets our business. Right. They, that, that person gets the business. That's not just visibility and credibility. It's also likability that helps you win business. Yeah. Anyway, let's, let's look to wrap up, Ruben. I, I gave you a couple of little quick fire questions earlier. Steve, you have a bit of a heads up. But look, software is one of those spaces where people love you and people hate you at the same time. But what's an insult that you've received that you're really proud of? Oh, gosh, I get so many insults. Hard to know, but I think sometimes people have said that, that I don't care what they think. And it may or may not be true that I don't care what they think. I will listen to somebody, but I like that because sometimes I think they're full of crap. And then I, right, I, I'm not going to be swayed by them just because they have a different opinion. I'm very happy to listen to somebody, but I have my own internal intrinsic motivation, if you will. So I'm trying to do the best I can, and I'm not trying to win a popularity contest with everybody. And if I think you are full of it, I'm 
may or may not call you out on it, but I'm certainly not going to go change how I think or what I do because of you telling me I should. Yeah, awesome. What's one thing about your business in building Mimarin that you didn't expect? I never set out to build a CRM. I, I, I started building tools to plug into enterprise CRMs because they didn't do certain things that I needed as a solo consultant. And then I started telling some people about it and they said, oh, can I have that? And so I sort of made this thing that I built for myself into an app that other people could use. And then they started saying, hey, Ruben, I love your stuff. I hate my CRM. Can you just make Mimarin be the CRM? And of course I said, no, that would be crazy. The world doesn't need another CRM. And it took me a long time to wrap my head around that here we are decades into the sort of the CRM era and there's hundreds of them, but there wasn't one from my tribe. I couldn't believe it. I didn't want to build it. I, I kept looking, thinking that it was there for me. And oh, for us. Me, surely. Yeah, I'm like, don't make me do this. This is crazy. Yeah. And there wasn't. What's your favorite productivity hack for entrepreneurs? I think getting very focused, like we were talking about earlier in the interview, about who you're trying to help, because it makes it so much easier to ignore or say no to the people that are a distraction. And I think what happens to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of solo consultants, we, we get overwhelmed and there's a phrase that startups don't die of starvation, they die of indigestion. And I think a lot of that happens to consultants as well. It looks like they're dying of starvation because there's not a lot of revenue, but it's because they're trying to do too many things for too many different people. And they can't break out in the area where they're really going to have a big impact. Even if it's an area, right? They can always change it later, but yeah. pick something and go do it really well. And then you can, like Steve Jobs said, hey, for everything we say yes to, we say no to dozens of things. When it's you and your time as a solo person, the one thing you can't get back is time. So you really got to be focused, not just from a sort of like productivity, like I'm mashing my keyboard really fast, but from a what am I actually working on and does it make a difference? Yeah, I love that. It reminds me of my year 12 economics lesson around effective specialization. You're probably better in your business than most people. But by doing everything, you can't do the one thing that moves the needle the most. What time of day do you get your best work done? This varies a bunch now that I'm a family man and I have a dog because I'm always getting interrupted. But really what I try to do is knock out the big chunk for the day in the morning and feel like if I've made it to lunch and, I, and if, if for some reason I can't do anything else, I've done the most important thing I set out to do, great. Speaking of family man. Favorite trip you've been on? Really hard to pick just one. Although we did just get back, wife and kids and I went to Japan recently, and that was a lot of fun. My son is learning Japanese, so we decided we'd go to Japan, and we had a great time, saw great things, met really nice people, ate great food, and so on. Yeah. All right, I'll throw one last one at you as a bit of a curly one. What's one thing about sales and marketing and CRMs that you wish everyone understood? Well, there's everyone and then there's my tribe and there's there's a difference. So the reason I ended up building a CRM is that traditionally CRMs are built for the VP of sales to track a sales team. And this is a perfectly natural thing for VP of sales to want to do, but it drives us solo people crazy because it basically just makes our lives really complicated without giving us benefit because we're not part of a sales team. So if you're a solo person, I go back to assuming you're in a relationship business, know exactly who you want to talk to, talk to them and do this on a repeating basis and good things will happen. And whether you're using sticky notes or Mimarin or a spreadsheet or whatever, HubSpot, whatever CRM works for you, it's like a camera, right? Whichever one you have with you that you like to use is the best one. Make sure you're having those conversations and good things will follow. Yeah, absolutely true. Ruben, thanks so much for sharing your expertise today. You can check out more about Mimarin and Ruben over at Mimarin.com, M-I-M-I-R-A-N.com. Ruben, thanks for joining us today. I've loved your insights and uh, experience and sharing those with our audience. Thanks so much for having me, Tim, and hopefully we'll both be back out on the court soon. Absolutely. And guys, thanks again for joining us on another episode of More Clients, Less Effort. We'll be back next week with another insight into some sales and marketing tips for your business and how you can systemize that to win more clients with less effort. Take care.